Chag Sameach, everyone. Good Yantif. Even more so than on Shabbat, when in the times that I've led since we've started this, I've been able to. Oh, there goes the lights. That's interesting. I'm now speaking in the dark. I wonder what's going to happen next. You don't really want to watch me in the dark and just listen to my voice. Let me see if this is something that Orlando can fix if I hint to him the right way. Excuse me. Vayomer Orlando Yehi Or. And Orlando says, let there be light. And there was light. Well done, Orlando. <clears throat> well, at least the timers work. That's good to know. Obviously, if you're watching, the, the timer works. And at 11.02, these lights go off. So even more so on, on the Shabbat, when I've been really convinced each time I've led, whether it's Shabbat morning or Shabbat afternoon, that there's been a sizable crowd there to daven with us. I, I have no idea who's out there. I have no idea. And we won't even be able to know a after the fact unless someone who's watching r sees who else is there and can tell me after the fact because since this is one long live stream the whole night, when I look at it after Yuntif, I'll see how many people viewed it at least once, but that's not an indication of who's viewing it now. But whoever you are, welcome. Welcome if you're a member of Temple Beth Am. Welcome if you're not a member of Temple Beth Am. Welcome if you spent part of the night so far on Temple Beth Am's Zoom room, not to be confused with Temple Beth Am's live stream. Welcome if you were part of the opening plenary that I led with Rabbi Haransky, or if you did not. My shiur tonight is going to kind of be a deeper dive into some of the issues that we talked about, the two of us, which were mostly focusing on a few verses from the book of, of Exodus in the Revelation story. And I call this class... Karov Rachok, close and far, the dynamics of distance at Sinai and beyond. Because issues of distance and closeness have been on our minds for 10 weeks now, 12 weeks. As I was walking here, by coincidence, I didn't plan this, I saw a new billboard that I haven't seen yet at a bus stop. And it was a picture of two women looking very uh, um, intimately at one another's faces. You see just their profiles. From the ages of them, it looked like it could be someone and their mother, although doesn't, you don't know for sure. And the slogan is beautifully complex and almost paradoxical. Stay apart, pull together. Because you know English, you know what it means. It means by permitting certain distance between you and the people you love, we'll all in society be able to pull together and surmount, sur sur survive this time. But the language is so interesting. Stay usually means close, but it's stay apart. So stay apart and pull usually means apart. Right? Like a pull apart chala. Pull together. Stay, stay apart. Pull together. I don't know if that was accident of branding or brilliant use of language to suggest that close and far are all mixed up. And in some ways are all one thing right now. You're much farther from me than you've ever been if you've ever studied with me on Shavuot. Some of you hundreds, thousands of feet, some of you miles away. Some of you might be time zones away. And yet we're experiencing something in a very together moment because we're doing Shavuot, bringing together people who otherwise never would have spent Shavuot together. A member of this community was talking about the paradox of this sanctuary. Why do we build this sanctuary in this shape so that we could be together, so we could be intimate, so you could see one another, 
so that the room would feel full even when it wasn't so full, whereas our previous sanctuary, even when it was pretty full, it felt empty. We wanted to invert that feeling of the previous sanctuary. And we built this gorgeous, beautiful sanctuary so that it could be full. And now it lies empty. Not quite the emptiness of the opening lines of the book of Echa, you know, the city of, of Jerusalem lying alone. It's not desolate. It's not forlorn. It's extraordinary. But it doesn't have you in it. And the paradox that we built a sanctuary for closeness just months before all of society was asked to surrender closeness for distance, but of course wait for it, surrendering closeness for distance so that we could pull together and be close to one another as we're fighting this scourge. Rachok and Karov are dancing with each other. This evening, Rabbi Haransky and I spoke about the sense from the 19th chapter of Shemot of Exodus that the Revelation story was replete both with great intimacies, God revealing God's self to the Jewish people in a way that humanity had never experienced the divinity before, and yet great boundaries as the mountain itself was protected from an onslaught by the Israelites and the Israelites themselves were protected from the overwhelming intimacy of God. There were mechitzot, dividers at Sinai. There were warnings, stay away as you get close. Stay away as I come down to reveal myself to you. I reveal myself to you from the great heavens far away. Right here on the mountain, you're at my feet. The Torah couldn't figure out, or maybe it knew exactly what it was doing in saying Torah is revealed close and far simultaneously. Torah is safe and frightening simultaneously. God pres God's presence is the most comforting blanket and the most frightening prospect simultaneously. We want revelation. We can't withstand revelation simultaneously. We want to be close in. We need to be far away from those that we love simultaneously. I have four texts I want to share with you. We may not get through all of them. I want to start with the craziest one, even though it kind of should be the last one, but I want to make sure we get to it because it's delicious and crazy and wacko and fantastical and wonderful. Uh, some of you may have the source sheet if you're a member of Temple Beth Am and you get our emails. It went out just before Yuntif. I think somewhere on the website, if you're manipulating the website, there should be a link to my source sheet. On the source sheet, we're starting with source number seven, but even so, I'm going to read every word of the source out loud because I don't think everyone has it in front of them. So the first six sources were mostly the sources that Rabbi uh, Haransky and I taught in the evening session. But here is my first source for tonight, but just source seven on the, on the source sheet. It comes from the great Piazetzner Rebbe, Rabbi Kalanimus Kalman Shapira from the town of Piazetz. That's why it's called the Piazetzner Rebbe which makes me think, oh, yeah, I made a mistake. I should have started a nigun by the Piazetz Nerebi because I've actually been singing nigunim by the Piazetz Nerebi recently. Maybe I'll finish with it. He was a remarkable man and leader. He somehow de facto became the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto after he was deported there, and he was murdered by the Nazis, martyred and murdered by the Nazis. And he left behind a tremendous legacy of bright and creative insights into the Torah and a musical legacy as well. And he has several collections that were preserved, published mostly posthumously. And this collection is called Derech HaMelech, literally the way of the king. And this is his commentary, not on our Parsha or the Parsha of uh, Revelation, but Parsha at Noach. doesn't matter how he connects it to Parsha for our purposes. He's quoting a verse from Revelation, quoting a verse from this 20th chapter of Shemot. I'm going to read it in Hebrew because it'll kind of come out better if I read in Hebrew and translate than if I just read my own translation. Vechutz min hapashut. Aside from the simplest meaning of what? Of, quote, Vechol ha'am ro'im takolot. Chapter 20 of Exodus, verse 15, where it says rather quizzically that the entire people saw 
with their eyes, et hakolot, the voices. It's a quizzical verse. How do you see a sound unless you live on the southern coast of Connecticut and you live by the Long Island sound, but um bump northeast joke. How do you see a sound? And yet the Torah says at Sinai, all the nations, all of the nation, roim, saw, see, hakolot, the sound. Some people resolve that by saying that they saw lightning that was followed by thunder, suggesting God's presence, but it's still... The, the, the verse begs the question of what, how a sound could be seen. Aside from the simple reading of that, Shepiresh Rashi, that Rashi, whom Stevie just quoted, commented on, Sheraut Hanishma, Rashi tries to explain that they saw something that's otherwise audible. How? It's a miracle. What's wrong with a miracle? God is full of miracles. If the sea can split, if the Nile can run with red blood, then something which is audible can be seen. That's our God. Who's going to limit God? Are you going to say God couldn't do that? That's how Rashi explains it. Aside from that, so the Piazestra says, all right, I accept that. I'm not going to limit God's power to do that miracle. Odir mazlanu kenir el el, or kenis karla el. We can also see the following thing hinted to us, as I mentioned earlier, so he made a reference to this earlier in his book. Shekevan shepaska zohamatan. Very interesting phrase. Since their filth, zohamatan, the filth of the Israelites, just go with me for a second. Since the filth of the Israelites ended, they had rid themselves of it. What is the filth that's being referred to? One of my friends and teachers. Rabbi David Ingber, who knows much more about the Bezetzner's teaching than I do, believes that he's referring here to the filth of mortality. Once they had entered into this almost angelic realm of being around Sinai, and momentarily they no longer had the, the filth of being only human beings who would live and die and who would ever take account of them, this read suggests that all of the nation of Israel at Sinai became angels. They elevated to a different supernal realm. Venit alu, they went up, ascended. Venit kadshu Yisrael, and Israel became kolkach, so holy, that since they had almost departed from a human form and become not demigods, but hovering in between what you and I think of as a human existence versus a divine existence. Nit hafchu lotaot shalmala. If you haven't followed the Hebrew, wait for it. They became the letters of the heavens. Huh? The Piazes the Rebbe is saying, and just allow it to be playful. Once the people had stopped being more mere mortal humans, Nit hafchu, they switched themselves into letters, A, B, C, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Shelmala of the heavens, supernal letters, the letters by which the Torah was given, people becoming letters, humans becoming the utterances of God, therefore not just hearing revelation, but being revelation. Midvar Hashem, they became the word of God that God spoke to them upon the receiving of Torah. How could you stage this if it was a movie? God is speaking to the Israelites, almost like a green mile kind of a way. The way that God, the way that God is speaking revelation to the Torah is God is speaking the letters, but the letters are no longer the letters. The letters are what the Israelites used to be. God is speaking Israel to Israel. Israel is hearing God give Torah as themselves. They're receiving themselves. Some of you know, may know from the Kabbalistic literature that the Hebrew letters are thought to have mystical qualities. They can be anthropomorphized in all sorts of interesting commentaries. So the letters can have human character, and the humans in the story, according to the Behazetzner, become letters. That's not a downgrade in their status. It's an upgrade. Imagine you could become a mem. 
you could become a face so feet. Kol echad kefi shorasho. Each Israelite according to his root, his shoresh. What's going on here probably is the following. The counting that the Torah has as to how many people were at Revelation was about 600,000. And depending on whom you're, li you're listening to, there are about 600,000 letters in the Torah. And each of those letters is considered to be a shoresh, a root, such that every individual Israelite, men, women, and child, jumped into the one and very one letter that he or she was supposed to be, his or her root. So the person who was supposed to be the Lamed in the word Yisrael became a Lamed, and the person who was supposed to be a Mem in the word Moshe became a Mem. And there was a transfiguration. Sounds very Eastern, right? Sounds like a tradition of, of, uh, of a human being being transferred into another living spirit over the generations. There's some of that in the Jewish Kabbalistic tradition as well. You just may not know that much of it if you're not familiar with those texts. And since all of Israel is doing this together, all these letters, the 600,000 individual letters, they came together and they became speech. It wasn't just like, like a smattering of letters like we have on certain parts of Arona Kodesh. The letters formed words. The words formed sentences. The sentences formed paragraphs. The paragraphs formed parashot. And Torah happened. And because it all happened at the same time, here's the resolution of the problem in the original text, ra'u et hakolot shediber Hashem. They did indeed see the sounds that God had spoken. Because what did they see? They saw themselves becoming letters. Right? That problem in the verse, and all the nations saw the sounds. Well, normally you can't hear something that's audible. Rashi says you can. It's a miracle. Piaz Nestor says it's a different kind of miracle. The Israelites ceased to be human Israelites. They became the very letters of revelation. And then somehow they were able to see that. They were, they, they were both humans and letters at the same time. And they saw the letters. So they did see the sounds that God spoke with. Hainu bi Yisrael ra'u, which is to say, Israel saw Israel. What sounds did they see? They saw God's utterances as themselves. Human form of sound. Vezeh, and that's what it means, vechol ha'am rohim etakolot, that all the nations saw the sounds. Vechol ha'am yachab ra'u, the whole nation saw it together. Al yedei, how? By means of the fact, shenit starfu yachad. They all joined together. Me'otiyot, from letters, Ledibor to speech. They became speech. What an interesting, fantastical notion. Vehem chashvu, and they thought, and the thought here is kind of a nervous thought. They, in this, you know, when you're a human being and you're turning into a letter, are you excited or are you nervous? Do you think this is the beginning of something wondrous or do you think this is the end of everything you know as a human being? Suspend disbelief for the moment, otherwise it's not even worth reading the text. They thought, they were nervous, they were concerned, Shehem ba'atzmam yitpatlu, that they would somehow just annihilate themselves, that they'd become nothing, lihit batel, to become batel, to become zero. They were nervous that there'd be no human form left of them. Lagamre, completely. V'tachtahem, and instead of the human forms they once inhabited, yitgalu otiyot shalmala, the supernal letters would be revealed, which is a beautiful thing, but no more people. Another verse he quotes, the Yomru el Moshe, they said to Moshe, this is directly from the Torah, Daber ata imanu, you speak to us, Moses, venishma'a, and we will listen, we will obey. And the Piazestner says, Lo shihiyu ro'im kolot, shanach nanit batel. We're not interested in seeing the voices, meaning our becoming letters, even if that's considered an upgrade, shanach nanit batel, if that means the end of us. We're not interested in so becoming speech that we're no longer people able to receive the speech that we become. I know it's a bit of an Escher painting-like image. Rock, rather, the nishma'a will listen, which means we'll still have to be there in order to listen. The al-yadaberimanu Elohim penamut. 
and let God not speak directly to us lest we die. Another quote from the Revelation story. Shalonit patela gamre. We don't want to be completely consumed even in this extraordinary process. If you're already in your brain linking to what I started with, as we get as intimate as it's possibly be, we're becoming God's speech. We don't want to become so intimate that there's nothing left of us. How could we be hugged any more closely by God than to emerge from God's mouth as God's word? Yeah, but too much of that and we're gone. And then what's the point of that closeness? What's the point of closeness if you lose yourself? In any dyad. What's the point of closeness in a marriage if there's no self left? That's not a healthy recipe. What's the point of attachment to an idea or a notion that elevates you if you become so wedded to it you lose your own sense of discretion as you're thinking about that idea? Then you become a fundamentalist and you don't longer exist. You're just a part of the idea that swept you up. We don't want that. Another quote from the, from the Revelation, Vayomer Moshe, Moshe said, Al Tiru, don't be afraid of this. It's that, what you're afraid of is not going to happen. Ki levavor nasot etchem ba'elohim. God has come to test you. This whole weird transfiguration is not to eliminate you, but to test you, to see if you can tolerate momentary, intense, exquisite closeness with the Holy One. Keperish Rashi, as Rashi explained, leharim etchem, to elevate you, not to eliminate you, to elevate you. This is supposed to be like a memorable experience for you Israelites. You'll be reminiscing 30 years from now. You remember that crazy day at Sinai when we stopped being people for a few minutes and we became letters? Wasn't that great? You can only reminisce if you're still there. You can only reminisce about the moment of intense closeness if you have enough distance from it that you can cogitate on it and think about it because you're no longer in it. Veloshatem tit padlu. Not, the goal is not that you become nullified, batel. Votiyot shalmala, and only become the letters of the Holy One. Yavo tachtechem, that only that, that the letters will replace you completely. Rakshatem tit alu, only that you ascend, aliyah. Vetit havu, and you turn into la'otiyot shalmala, that you turn towards the higher letters, kachnireli, that's how it seems to me. That's the end of the wild commentary. What does it mean? I think it means a thousand things. What I think it means for the purposes of this conversation is that the Piazetzner is dealing with some of the things that are laid out in the pshat of the verses themselves, which is that close and far, intense and intimate, but to the point of annihilation. We're all hovering in that moment of exposure. Exposure brings you close. Exposure can be too much. And I hear him saying that the people could not receive Torah as people. It was too much for them. They had to convert themselves or allow themselves to be converted into almost a piece of the revelation to receive it. So that's a move towards intimacy. As people, they were too, too human to receive Torah. Rabbi David Weiss Halivni, who sadly is at the, at the very end of, of, of an extraordinary life, who's thought of as one of the greatest living Talmud scholars, and also wrote a beautiful piece on his understanding of what happened at Sinai calling Revelate, called it Revelation Restored. Let's see if I can get this right. He, he's he's, a, he's a, both a Talmud scholar and a humanity scholar, right? So he knows the Talmud literally by heart, but he's also a man of letters and a man of the academy, and, and he's wound his faith, his beautiful faith, through his understanding of, of the humanities and science. And he said that there was a pristine revelation from God at Sinai. He believes it. An actual revelation of God from Sinai. 
But the moment it left God's mouth and entered human hands, we sullied it because we're human. We're not God. And so the Torah that we received and passed down is our best facsimile of God's revelation. But it was already humanized. Inevitably, once the human being has touched it. And therefore, there are mistakes and errors and inconsistencies. It's a theology of Sinai similar to Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel's. And it suggests that human beings, qua human beings, however wonderful we are, we're still base beings and slightly evolved apes. And as human beings, we just weren't ready to receive Torah in its pristine form. So to move closer to Torah, we became the letters of Torah. That's a move towards closeness. But in the very moment that we watched ourselves becoming the letters of Torah, we got terrified that we were getting too close that there'd be nothing left of us. And so as soon as we got close, we pulled a U-turn so that we could watch Sinai from a distance and watch this happen almost from a third-party stance because too close in would not be bearable, survivable, tolerable. It's a wonderful description of the unbearable awesomeness of receiving a divine text as a human being and feeling so close that you need to get farther away and sometimes feeling so far away that it could, could, could the Torah throw you a bone and bring you a little bit closer in so you felt God's kiss? That's text number one. Speaking of God's kiss, text number two, or on your sheet, text number eight, from Shir Hashirim Rabbah, Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, which is read on the seventh day of Pesach, or Shabbat of Cholomoyed Pesach, one of the five Migilot, the five scrolls. And this is from the classic rabbinic midrash on Shir Hashirim. And it's um, playing on one of the opening verses of Shir Hashirim, Yishakeni minishikot pihu. Yishakeni minishikot pihu. Remember that Shir Hashirim, if you're not aware of it, it reads like a love story, an ecstatic love story, a beautiful love story between a man and a woman. And it's understood by the rabbis to be one of the holiest texts in our traditions. And it's erotic. And it's beautiful. And it's intimate. And it's also understood to be a metaphor for our relationship with God. And the body parts and the kisses and the limbs and the intertwining of those verses are not two human beings lying with each other, but us in a constant dance to be close to God. But the interesting thing about Shir Hashirim is that the union is never consummated. It's always hoped for. It's an intense love from a distance. And this verse, Yishakeni, may he kiss me, minishikot pihu, with kisses from his mouth. So the pshat is a woman fantasizing about get, receiving kisses from the mouth of her lover, or the woman being Knesset Yisrael, the people of Israel, receiving kisses from the Holy One, the male presence of God. So it's a verse that the rabbis want to explore. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan, a great sage from the land of Israel, said, Malach haya motzi hadibor milifnei hagadosh baruch hu. At Revelation, at Sinai, you don't read about it in, verse, in chapter 19 of Shemot, but it's there. There was a malach. What's a malach? An angel. Would motzi dibor, remember how the last source was talking about the dibor, the speech of God, would, would remove the speech of God word for word from out of the presence of the Holy One. I'll call dibor v'dibor, every word. So God, so the opening lines of, of uh, Ten Commandments are, Anochi Adonai Lohechem, I'm Lord your God. So this Midrash imagines an angel going like this, Anochi, Anochi. Angel takes the word Anochi and transports it. Where? We'll see in a second. God says another word, Adonai. The Malach takes the word Adonai and packages it up and transports it. There's a, a conveyor of God's word from God's mouth to where? We'll see. 
The angel would take every individual word of revelation and bring it personally, individually, UPS, Amazon Fresh, to every Israelite present. Could it get more intimate than that? I'm not just receiving revelation in general. I am being personally delivered every single one of the words of God. Would you like that? I'd like that, I think. The Omer and the Malach, the angel, would say to the Israelite, Do you like this word? This first word of revelation, Anochi. Anochi works for you. Will you take it? Will you accept this word? And as those words would be strung together into verses and verses into ideas, the angel would say, These are the laws that are contained in these words. These are the punishments in these verses. Are you aware of that? Do you accept that? These are the decrees in these words. And here are the number of mitzvot in these words. And here are the very light, easy to follow laws. And here are the chamurim the very stringent ones. Word for word. One word at a time. Here are all the rewards that are promised for you if you accept these words. And the Israelite, each Israelite, one at a time, 600,000 each for each word of revelation would say, Hain, yeah, I accept. Very intimate. The Choser Omerlo, and the angel would come back and say to each Israelite again, he would go around a second time. Mekabel at Elahuto Shel HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Do you individually, individually, not just you as a nation, do you individually accept the divinity of God? And each Israelite, according to this Midrash, would say, yeah, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. Meyad haya noshko alpiv. Immediately, the angel... Remember our verse, Yishakeni minishikot pihu, I'd like to be kissed by the kisses of his mouth. The angel would noshko alpiv, would kiss the Israelite on the mouth. Hadahu dechtiv. And that's what we mean when we say in the fourth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, verse 35, Ata horeta ladaat. You might know that verse from Simchat Torah. It's the opening one of the 19 verses that are said when the Torah comes out for Hakafot. What does Ata Horeta Ladat mean? Ata you, Horeta, it's in the passive. You were shown Ladat, to know, to understand. And then the Midrash says, Ayyadeh Shaliyah. So here what the Midrash has done, it's resolved several problems. What does it mean to say that we want kisses from his mouth? Are we really getting kisses from God's mouth? That's a little bit too anthropomorphic even for the rabbis. No, kisses from the angel's mouth, who is the personal delivery person of God's revelation, such that we can make sense of this verse, that you were shown, it was, it was made clear in your individually accepting every word of revelation, to know, and to know in biblical Hebrew means to know intimately. You were shown to have an intimate embrace of and accept of this word. You had union with these words. There was a kiss. A kiss is extremely intimate. A kiss on the lips is extremely intimate. The Rabbanin Amrin, in the same Midrash, the rabbi said, so that, that whole section was from Rabbi Yochanan, the rabbi said something similar, similar image, but I want to read through it because it goes in a slightly different direction. Hadibor atzmo haya mechazer akol echad vechad. Forget the angel. <laughs> it's not that there was a delivery person, angel, taking the word from God's mouth and bring it every, indi in, every individual Israelite. Remember how in the Piazetzner's text, people became words? Here, the word is becoming a living thing. The word itself, hadibor atzmo, would go around to every Israelite, like making a case, like the word anochi. Let your brain expand to accept this, dear listener of this class. Anochi, the first word of revelation, 
himself or herself, is the word anochia, masculine or feminine, who knows, who cares, would go down the mountain and find every individual Israelite and present themselves, hello, my name is Anochi, on the first word of revelation, do you accept me? We can't go forward. We can't get to Adonai or Eloheichem unless you accept me. He would go down to every single Israelite, but Omerlo, and say to him, Mikableni at Alecha, do you accept me upon you? Kach v'kach mitzvot yeshbi. As the words would come down, this part is similar to the previous one, here are all the commandments that are comprised of me, me, because I'm the word. V'kach dinin yeshbi, here are the rules that are in me. V'kach v'kach anashin yeshbi, here are the punishments that are in me. Kach v'kach gzerot yeshbi, here are the decrees in me. I'm going to be honest with you, this is what I comprise. Kach v'kach mitzvot yeshbi, these are the mitzvahs within me. Here are the easy ones, here are the harder ones. Here are other rewards for doing, for observing me. And the Israelite would say, Sure, I accept you. I accept you, Anochi, and I accept you, Adonai, and I accept you, Eloheichem, and I accept you, Shamor, preserve, and I accept you at Yom HaShabbat, the day of Shabbat. Every word would come down as a word, present itself as a word to each and every Israelite. Each and every Israelite would accept it. That's how revelation took place. Whatever image you had in your mind, whatever Charlton Heston scene you have, that's not how the Midrash, at least how this Midrash, sees it. Miyad, this is lovely. Immediately, Hadibor Noshko Alpiv. The word would kiss each Israelite on the mouth. Remember our verse from Shir HaShirin that we're trying to resolve? May I be kissed by the kisses of his mouth? It's not God's mouth. We don't want to imagine God as having lips. It's easier for us to imagine the, the word being able to kiss than God being able to kiss. The word would kiss each Israelite in the mouth. As if to say, as if it could happen. The limdo Torah, and in that way taught him Torah. Oh my God. The Israelites learn Torah by kissing each word, by being kissed by each word. And as the word was kissing them, it entered them, and Torah entered them. This is very erotic, very shira shirimi, very union, very fusion. There's no distinction between the word and the people, just like the Pia Zesner text. The people can become the words, the words can kiss the people. This is what it means to say in the, another verse from the fourth chapter of Devarim, verse 9, lest you forget these words, these words, that your eyes saw. How can eyes see words? Same problem as how can eyes see sounds? Dvarum dvarim shira'u enecha. The actual words that your eyes saw. When did your eyes see words? When words came down from Sinai and presented themselves in a petition, said, Do you accept me or not? How else could we possibly imagine that a word was speaking to you? So in this Shir Hashim Rabbah text, it's all intimacy, all closeness, very little distance. Right? It's only one side of the dialectic with the rabbis rhapsodizing, fantasizing that there was a consummation of a marriage at Sinai. Sinai is understood, Shabuot night is understood to be the consummation of the marriage where the betrothal took place at the, at the Sea of Reeds. We were engaged to God then. We consummated it tonight in physical union. Verse 9, sorry, source 9, the next source in our sheet, and I'm grateful to Stevie, who just taught before me, for reminding me of this text, sees it slightly more complicated. From the Babylonian Talmud, page 88b. Ve'amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, another sage from the land of Israel, said, Kol dibor v'dibor she'atza mi'pi ha'kadosh baruch hu. Every individual word that came out of the mouth of the Holy One. So again, we're talking about the actual moments of the pronouncements of revelation. 
And keep in mind the last text we studied where each dibur was a kiss, each dibur was a messenger bringing down the word, each dibur was a, was a union. Here in Masechet Shabbat it says, for every word that came out of the mouth of the Holy One, which we've been trained in the previous text to understand as an ecstatic, beautiful thing, yatsta nishmatan shel Yisrael, which means the breath of Israel departed. That's a euphemism for they died a little bit. <gasps> Every one of those kisses killed them if we combine these two, midrash, two midrashim. You ever hug too hard? Did you ever feel hugged or kissed too hard? Someone was so close into you that you were smothered? That's what this text is playing with. Every word of beautiful revelation that God spoke at Torah took a, at Sinai took a little bit of life away from the Israelites. A punch here, a punch there. I'm trying to kiss you. Where are you going? I'm trying to hug you. Why is there less of you? I'm trying to union, have a union with you, but you're disappearing. Shinemar, I have to sneeze. Excuse me. As it says, also in the Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 6, Nafshi yatsa'a bidabro, my soul departed with his word. In context of Shir Hashirim, it's as if to say in a love story, I, 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 I swooned at every word. A piece of me left at every word in a beautiful way. But the Midrash is reading it here in the Talmud as every word took some life out of me. Nafshi yatsa'ah. My soul departed. If you're telling me, the Midrash kind of asks itself, that at every word, they die a little bit, which means that at the first word of creation, Anochi, remember our friend Anochi? They died, right? Just like the Piazetzner was playing with it, they were afraid they were going to become letters and die. Dibor kiblu. How'd they receive the second word? How did they receive revelation as corpses? If you're telling me they died every single time a word was spoken, then they should not have been there to receive the second word. That the closeness of revelation word one eliminated the possibility of their receiving word two. The intensity of the love, of the closeness of the initial wooing killed them off and there was nothing there to hug in stage two but God doesn't want to be alone it's not good for a man to be alone it's not good for God to be alone so what happened in this beautiful midrash Horid Tal God brought down dew what kind of dew the very dew that is supposed to revive and resuscitate the dead at the end of days God performed mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, maybe quite literally in this text. He kisses them. I know I'm conflating to Midrashim. They die. <sighs> he blows dew upon them with another kiss and revives them. He kisses them and they're dead. He kisses them and they're alive. Closeness destroys. Closeness brings back to life. Shinemar, as it says, in the, ver in the book of Psalms, Geshem nedavot tanif Elohim, God, you brought down the beautiful, bountiful rain. Nachlarcha v'nil'a ata konanta. When your inheritance was weary, meaning when we were exhausted by your closeness, you brought us konanta, you sustained us. V'yamar Rabbi Shuvah Levi, and Rabbi Shuvah Levi further said, same rabbi, kol dibor v'dibor sh'yatsa mi pi kadosh baruchu, every word that the Holy One said, chazru Yisrael achorehen. In this version of the Midrash, they didn't die, they just retreated backwards. So anochi, Adonai, Eloichem, to everything that God said to bring them close, they got further away. You ever have that experience? You're so certain that you're going to use words in such a way that you're going to draw someone close to you, 
and yet as you keep speaking, you're experiencing them as more and more distant. Your intentions for closeness turn into distance, which of course means that your permitting distance can allow for closeness. They took a step back in fear, every word that he spoke. How, lo- how, f- how far do they step back, each word? Shneim asar mil, 12 miles. Every word of revelation set the Israelites from the mountain 12 miles away. Vehayu malachei asharet, and those ministering angels, the same angels perhaps that were bringing down the word from God's mouth in the previous midrash to see if the Israelites would accept them, medadinotan, would bring them back bring the hesitant, weary, nervous, frightened, kissed Israelites back in for another audience of God to hear God's word. And and here's another play on words, and how do we know this? We have it from the book of Psalms, chapter 68, verse 13, just three verses later from the the previous verse. Malachi tzvaot yididun yidudun. The host of angels will scatter yidudun. Altikre yidodun. Don't read the word as yidodun. This is a common rabbinic play. Say, saying, I know it looks like the word reads that, but if you change the vowels around a little bit, it'll mean, it'll mean the thing I want it to mean. Altikre yidodun. They will scatter, which means the sending away. Ella yidadun. Read it as he will, they will lead you back by the yad, by the hand. Even the proof text here, my friends, is a play on close and far. Don't read this as that the ministering angels will scatter you away, ye dodun, but bring you back by hand, ye dadun, or both. The ministering angels who represent God's awesomeness, by definition, distance us because the experience of religious awakening is too much to handle. And then we somehow come back via the same pathways, trying to follow God's messenger back into sanctuary, back into Torah, back into religious life, back into spiritual life, all at the same time. I'll close by reading with you a phenomenal commentary by the great early 20th century German Jewish philosopher and theologian Franz Rosenzweig. He's commenting here on a poem by Yehuda Halevi, who was a medieval uh, Jewish poet in Spain, I believe. Yehuda Halevi is known for that famous poem, Lid Biba Mizrach Va'ani Basof HaMa'arav. My heart is in the east, Israel, but I am in the deep west, which Spain felt like vis-a-vis Israel in the centuries that he lived. So I'm not bringing you the poem, I'm bringing you Franz Rosenzweig's commentary in the poem, These few paragraphs of Franz Rosenzweig, which is source 10 in your source sheet, deserve uh, six classes on their own. So we're going to do a totally unworthy job of rushing through it. This hymn, he's referring to the hymn upon which he's commenting the poem, part of that portion of the morning prayer, already filled with hymns, he's talking about a poem that Yehuda Levi wrote that was supposed to be inserted into morning prayers, filled with hymns, that speaks of Ezekiel's vision. Part of the morning davening talks about Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel's image of the ministering angels and on their chariots and the way they would, and they would daven with each other, v'karazeh, elzeh, v'yamar, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Ezekiel's vision of heavenly wheels and creatures, this hymn is animated by one single thought. And of course, just to make it clear, this is uh, a translation from the German. It's not my translation. I, and I also don't know German, so I have no idea to what extent it's a good translation. I'm taking it um, from, from where I found uh, the, the source, and I, I present it to you as is, but I can't comment on whether or not it's the proper translation from the German. It's animated by one single thought, but it is the ultimate thought ever be, to be surveyed by the human mind. That's a big statement. And it is the primary thought that was grasped by the Jewish mind. So it's the most important thought that humans have ever come up with, and the central thought of Judaism. And what is that thought? This is going to get esoteric. The idea that the remote God is none other than the near one. I'll say it again. 
the idea that he's claiming is the most important human thought and the central Jewish thought is that the God who is far is the God who is near. The remote God is none other than the near one. The unknown God, no other than the revealed one. The God you know nothing about and the God you know everything about is the same God. The God who is mystifying and the God who makes absolute sense to you is the same God and you're the same person in reaction to that God. Like your spouse is the most known person to you and perhaps the most mysterious person to you whose secrets you least understand. And the creator, none other than the redeemer. The universal God who created the universe, Breshit God, is the same God as the Jewish family God of the Pesach story who took us out of Egypt with an outstretched arm. It's the same God, even though these are polarities. This next part is really hard for me to understand, which means it's going to be even harder for me to explain, but I'll do my best. When God comes near us, all we can discern is what cannot be said. <laughs> the closer God comes to us, all we can make sense of is everything except that moment. Nevertheless, we can't help trying to say it, but we feel something, we want to articulate it. This is just because of His nearness. We, we feel the pressure to make sense of God's presence because God is near. So when we begin to say it, because we want to articulate some reaction to feeling close to God, most likely this happens because it and here Franz Rosenzweig kind of intentionally corrects himself. No, because he, God himself, enables us to do so. God permits a process that allows us to try to express what it means to be close to God, no matter how inadequately, because how, how good could a human being possibly be in expressing that, by beginning to draw away from us. The way God, after becoming close to us, allows us to say something about God is by withdrawing, to distance himself from us. I get close to you as God, to give you the feeling that you want to say something about that experience. And the way I allow you to say something that, ex that, that experience is by giving you some space, as in any healthy relationship. By distancing, him, distancing himself from us, God makes himself known to us as the remote one. By going far away, all of a sudden we can see God. Otherwise, God would be too close. And we understand God is the one who's far. And when he's entirely remote, to finish this little paradox, when he has distanced himself totally from us, we can even, <coughs> and here Franz Rosenzweig interjects somewhat cattily, hand me over to the secular arm, you inquisitors of the new theology, we can even prove its existence. Once God is sufficiently far from us, not close to us, ah, then we can think about God with some dispassionate clarity and even prove that the God who we couldn't even like get a word out about when God was close to us is a real God. For nearness and distance as such tell us nothing about whether or not that mutual concern exists that alone makes all knowing true. Thus, in this case, whether man is of concern to God and God is of concern to man. It doesn't matter how close or far you are. That says nothing about the question about whether or not you care about the person that you're wondering if they're close or they're far. The real-time version of this in my life is the physical distance separating me from my parents on the east coast of the United States that I haven't seen for quite a long time and I don't know when I'll see them again. This theology of our relationship with God is asking me to consider that that physical distance means absolutely nothing when it comes to describing what I feel for them or what they feel for me. Because there's also no guarantee that if we were in the same room, that our relationship would be at its strongest. Or that if we're miles or years apart from each other, that it's a distance that must keep us actually separate. Even in the most terrifying proximity, man can look away, and then he will have no idea what has happened to him. And in the remotest distance, God's and man's glance can burn into each other to such a degree that no matter how far away they are, man can glance at God and God can glance at man even though they're very distanced. And the coldest abstractions become warm in our mouths, warmer than any of our upset chit-chat. I have no idea what that was in the German. That the 
glance from human to God and God to, to human, and I think from people from one another, from a very distant distance, as in through a Zoom, perhaps, can be warmer than any silly talk that happens when two people find themselves maybe serendipitously in the same place. Nearness, remoteness, no matter. What does matter is that whatever is spoken here as well as there must be spoken before his countenance with the you of the poem who never turned away, not even for one moment. At Yisker on Shabbat morning, I'm going to speak a little bit more about you, the word you, the intimate you. And what I leave you with, you, you, is that the power to bridge chasms that seem unbridgeable is an unlimited power the possibility that closeness can become overwhelming and will demand distance is a ubiquitous feeling. That we can survive and thrive this era of physical distance by drawing close in ways that we never would have thought of before. That when God is most distant to you, that might be the very moment where the invitation to relationship is most ripe and that when you address any other, a person or a divine as you, there's a chance for an embrace and a chance for a kiss. Chag Sameach. Good Enjoy the next session. See you tomorrow.